I'm Hector Saldana. I'm the music curator here at the Whitliffe Collections, and I want to thank you very much, and Susan and Jerry Jeff and Sally and Bill, everyone, for being here. Um, I want to give you a little lay of the land of what to expect and what I was thinking when we put this event together. One of the things, uh, and Barbara mentioned it, long after we're gone, the Whitliffe Collection is going to be here, and the materials for young people, for students, for researchers to look at. And you can't have a Jerry Jeff Walker event without having music. And the Whitliffe Collections is about having music, but also about inspiration. And this young artist right here, I think, embodies that aspect of the Whitliffe. And I think we'll go to what Jerry Jeff music is all about. He was, a, I want you to look, this is Rachel Laven. She's from San Antonio, Texas. She um, was a new folk winner at the Kerrville Folk Festival. That's one of the highest honors any folk artist, especially a young one, can win. Uh, she has an album called Love and Lucases. But I want you to, but she comes from a musical family. Her parents are in the house, the Lavens. She has a lot in common with Jerry Jeff. You know, his background, his grandparents, they had a family band. She has a family band. I want you to look at Rachel. Jerry Jeff was about that age when he came up with Mr. Bojangles and when he was kicking around. Not famous. And, uh, yeah, no, 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 no. So th we're going to do a little short musical program, and I want to explain the three songs that she's going to sing. First of all, you can't have a, a Jerry Jeff and Susan event without having Mr. Bojangles. Rachel is going to sing sort of the, her take on the Nina Simone arrangement, which is Jerry Jeff's favorite. The second song will be a song that is unpublished, that we discovered on those tapes that we restored, which we can only do with donors like yourselves, you know, that we can sort of dream of these projects and then actually execute them. So many of you may not know that as a young man, and I'm talking about younger than Rachel, Jerry Jeff was a folk singer, even a protest singer, singing about issues like poverty, hunger, we found some songs about that, civil rights, government corruption. It's, it's really amazing where, you know, first of all, where the artist went, but how he started, you know. Even uh, Bob Dylan used to play piano for Bobby V before it was Bob Dylan. So Rachel is going to sing a, a great song called I Look For That Day To Day, which is a, a, a beautiful song, but it shows Jerry Jeff in that Woody Guthrie, Bob Dylan mode. And then lastly, she'll close with a song that I personally love called the Pickup Truck Song because I think it's so autobiographical, it's so upbeat, and it is what Jerry Jeff, in a sense, is about. I, I guess if I'm sounding a little excited, it's because I'm just back from Nashville where the Country Music Hall of Fame launched its Outlaws and Armadillos exhibition. It uses material from the Whitliffe collections, and Jerry Jeff is very well represented there. And you have to understand, Jerry Jeff Walker is part of the big bang of Texas music. You know, you tr Viva Terlingua is that record. And I'll make that art. Him, his, and Michael Martin Murphy's, you know, they were on the front of that wave. So anyway, without any further ado, Rachel Laven. Thank you, Hector. Well, it was a great honor to be here and sing songs for you, Jerry. Especially iconic ones. <laughs> it's not every day we get to sit in the room with a songwriter that wrote the iconic song and actually play it for them. No pressure at all. <laughs> Jangles any dance for you. Worn out shoes, the silver hair, a ragged shirt, and baggy pants. That old saw shoe. He jumps so high, he jumps so high, and he lightly 
Said the name Bojangles, then he danced till day. Threw out the cell. He grabbed his pants for a better stand, so he jumped so high. He kicked his heels. He let go a laugh. And he shook his clothes all around. Danced for those at minstrel shows and county fairs Throughout the South He spoke with tears of 15 years How his dog and him traveled without Said I dance now every chance at honky tonks for drinks and tips. But most of the time I spend behind these county bars, cause I drink a bit. He shook his head, oh, he shook his head. I heard someone ask him respectively. Thank you. So I had to tune my guitar a whole step down <laughs> because Jerry Jeff, you sing songs about seven steps up for me. <laughs> I guess seven, it would be seven steps down technically. I couldn't quite sing an octave up. This is a cool tune. Respectfully. I said respectably. If it's respect, that, that's not a word, is it? That's not a word. Yeah, see? That's the nerves. Well, 
Well, she, but she sang it that way. And I, I, loved, I loved adding that, that word, just that one word. It, it adds so much, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> when you get the word right. <laughs> but respectfully, yeah. It's, it's just a little nod, you know? Yeah, no, I, I always wanted to add, I definitely wanted to add that. That was a great little. I love this song. It, 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 it reminds me. What is it? Reminds me of Woody Guthrie. Mostly because I always have to have a lyric sheet when I sing Woody Guthrie songs. <laughs> truth I live to with pride. The day when all men will look with their hearts and see where the hopes of men from afar. And the one who is locked out because of his skin will find the door open and proudly walk in. And to those who use hate behind guns in the war, we'll know a world of peace never seen. And I look for that morning today And I guess that it's still on the way Until then, I'll keep bumming Cause a better day is coming And I hope as I go that tomorrow Day I know is a forming those afternoons of hopes that I feel unfolding when a man can bow down in worship or prayer and never be told to whom or to where where the natural love of two souls deep in truth can stand naked now and not be ashamed by the rule and a man can choose to be a king or a beggar and the laws will be fair and the rich they ain't favored and the social differences that are not understood can be forced into practice by a whip and a hood and i look for that midday today and i guess that it's still on the way until then keep bumming cause a better day is coming and I hope as I go that tomorrow won't be as slow That nighttime of peace that I need so much. Where the poet's tears get their full reward. And he needs no shuffling for his room and board. And the crossing of the tracks by the poverty's child can be made with pride and not a broken smile. And the singer's song can be straight and true. And he doesn't need to protect his heart from you. And the loner's way is not thought of in sorrow by the shaky hearts afraid to look for tomorrow. And I look for that evening today. But I guess that it's still on the way. Until then, I keep bumming. Cause a better day is coming And I hope as I go That tomorrow won't be as slow
This one's a fun one. Yeah, I used to look forward to Saturday. Me and my grandpa would get away. We'd hop in the pickup truck and we'd go to town. Well, we had a couple things that we had to do. Wasn't long before we were through. Then we let that pickup truck just to wander around. We'd make a run to the county dump. We always wave when we see someone. And grandpa would make up songs as we roll along. To the post office without fail we get some feed and we check out the mail And we never take the same road twice on the way back home Well, I spent a few years out running free Spent two or three in New York City Then I moved back to Texas I was tired and I'd had enough I used to go to Luke and Bach on Saturdays Cause Hondo had a way to brighten up my day And he'd always make me laugh when we walked road in the pickup truck We'd make a run to the county dump We always waved when we saw someone And Hondo'd make up stories as we roll along To the post office without fail We'd get some chew and we'd check out the mail And we never take the same road twice on the way back home Well, I miss my grandpa and Hondo, too. I miss the things that we used to do. So last week I went out and I bought an old pickup truck. Now me and the kids spend Saturdays. We do fun things in a simple way. And we always start the day with a ride in the pickup truck. We make a run to the county dump. We always wave when we see someone. The kids like to make up songs as we roll along. To the post office without fail We always check out the mail And we always take the same road twice on the way back home Nope, we never, we never take the same road twice on the way back home Cause half the fun is getting lost on the way back home Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Jerry Jeff Walker. Right. Rachel Laven, folks. Rachel Laven. Thank you, Rachel. Fantastic, girl. <laughs> Fantastic. Rachel Laven. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Like I said earlier, Jerry Jeff Walker, without a doubt, part of the Big Bang of what we call and know as Texas music, whether you want to call it bro country, Americana, folk country, country music, Texas music is Jerry Jeff Walker. Susan Walker, I think, you know, you all may not know the whole story. She's his wife. She's his manager, made huh. business manager. <laughs> she says that. But it's her, you know, a lot of times you hear about you know, it's a cliche, the woman behind the man. But this is the woman, not only beside the man, sometimes in front of the man. The woman that, if she has to grab the necktie of a record exec, has done it. The one that is, you know, his biggest fan, the mother of his kids, their kids, you know, is Jerry Jeff's great advocate and arguably, you know, a way to, that not only, you know, Jerry Jeff is a portrait of re from beginning as a young man when he was on a ukulele. You'll notice we have a couple of instruments over there on the side. They're just like fishing lures. We're not expecting Jerry Jeff to sing, but you never know. A musician may pick up an instrument there and he may kind of show off. We just like to tempt the superstars that way, you know. But anyway, we're honored to have him here at the Whitliff Collections. We're, you know, obviously celebrating... Viva Jerry Jeff, the origins and wild times of a Texas icon. We've gotten such great reviews of that exhibit. It's a team effort with the archivists, with the other curators, 
with Jerry Jeff and Susan's input and other musicians. I want to say a quick hello to Rosie Flores and Patricia Vaughn, musicians themselves in their own right here today and everybody that's here. So what we're going to do, and I, uh, you know, I had to become a Jerry Jeff Walker geek, you know, as you de delve into those materials and you just <laughs> dig further and further. It's a great story. And, you know, one of the things in putting that exhibit together is a lot of stuff we don't know. So if, you know, we're going to try to tell not the whole story, but parts of the story. But really what I'm intrigued about is the relationship, the friendship. I won't go to Oprah on you, you know, but... <laughs> But anyway, let's start. How many cars you had to give away? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I don't always uh, type out my questions, but I, but I wanted to make sure it was even Stephen questions for Susan and Jerry Jeff, and we keep it all engaged. Now, once they take over the microphone, there's no telling who will uh, win out on, uh, on time there, but we'll start. I'm gonna start are, are we in competition? No. <laughs> well, I don't know. Start your watches. No. This first question for Susan. So uh, I don't know if you all ever get to those birthday bashes, but they're at the Paramount Theater this year. It was an amazing show, jam-packed, the Green Hall show. And I noticed from the wings, Susan there watching, bopping, really, you know, joyful, very sort of uh, almost protective looking at, at her husband as he's performing. And I just wanted to ask you, what's sort of running through your mind at those moments? I mean, uh, what, are you trying to pay attention to every detail, or what are you focusing on? No, I just try to look that way. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, this year was, was different, because he had gone through his health scare. And that was really the first time that I had seen him in front of that many people in that great sounding hall. And, and I think it was a little emotional. Yeah. Did you, do you feel protective in those moments? I mean, what was, I mean? No. No. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I, t I totally trust Jerry Jeff. He's got the stage thing down. Right. <laughs> so my, my one area that I have. That <laughs> <laughs> so, so Jerry, as the as the artist, though, how is it? I mean, is it comforting to know that Susan is right there? I mean, can solve any problem that may go wrong at any moment there in the concert setting? You know, I mean. Well, in the concert setting, once the, the show is there and the crowd is there, your work is done. So all you got to do now is just not blow it, you know. <laughs> just, uh, But, you know, just to have as good a time as you, as you can. The hard work was done, getting the attention, getting the people there, getting us together. The, the tricky part was how my voice was going to react at this point. Uh, it's different than I remember it. Right. Well, it sounded great. Yeah. And uh, it, I mean, it was uh, you know fan absolutely fantastic, and I think the the reviews uh, bore that out. Um, I must add too that you know we the, that second song. I look for that day today that uh, yeah. Rachel sang probably the first time in over fifty years that has been sung uh, on a stage. If you ever sang that song on stage, we found that I, on a demo. I don't. I don't exactly. It's a young person's whole look at everything that's wrong. I remember saying I, I, I quit. Everybody over 30 was, was fucked up and uh, <laughs> I didn't trust anything out there. I was, that's why I really sunk to the street level was I wanted to see the country. I didn't know how I was going to do it, you know, uh, with a thumb and you could do it. I always think that that's the one thing about America that's great is that you can do that. You can see from people's couches move around you, um, I had a cop stop me one time. I was at a crossroads intersection. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm hitchhiking up to Virginia. He said, why are you going there? I said, because I've never been there. And he said, well, uh, you can't, you don't have a job or anything, do you? I said, no, I'm seeing the country. He said, well, all right, well, move along. I said, that's exactly what I was doing before he stopped <laughs> He looked back and then <laughs> I had to stick one more jab in there, didn't I? <laughs> Let me just add to one of the things that we've discovered on these uh, recordings, and we're talking about tapes that were made in the summer of 1964 in New Orleans coffee houses and some song demos that he made in 1965. 
So a long time ago, uh, they, those tapes sold. They had to be baked, restored, digitized. But especially whenever Jerry Jeff is in front of an audience, there was always some laughter. You know, you were all, he always had a great rapport with people. That's one of the ingredients of the artist. I mean, you know, when we say, you know, one of the things I wanted to show with the exhibit, in other words, how did this young man from a small town, how did he become Jerry Jeff Walker? Well, he was the total package, and part of that is to relate with an audience, to be comfortable in any setting, and you were sh he was showing it, at, like I said, at an age younger than uh, even Rachel, when you were about 21. Well, somebody Rachel. always said that I looked like I was enjoyed what the music I was doing. And I said, well, I pick songs that I enjoy singing, and I realized that that was important, that, that that's something, I don't know, you got to look like you're really enjoying it. I thought Rachel had that easy, easy rapport with being up here. Yes. Um, let me ask Susan. You all met around 1972. What was your first impression of Jerry Jeff? <laughs> the truth, yeah, we want... We're going to be truth in here right now. I don't remember. We... He says my impression, not yours. Okay. <laughs> it's okay if you don't remember. Okay. All right. Well, we have a different version of the first time we met. So, which one? I, I guess you want to hear mine. I want to hear it. Yes. So variety has something to do with it. <laughs> Actually, it was over a, a record player, and I had a... a uh, house on up on Show Creek in Austin, and uh, a lot of writers hung out there. And I was living with one at the time, and um, and suddenly these musicians started coming by, and I, I was in another part of the house, and I kept hearing like like my I had Rolling Stones, Let It Bleed on or something, and and I kept hearing this other music on, and I would go to and take it off. It wasn't marked or anything, and I'd take it off and put my stack back on, and then suddenly. <laughs> about three times I met this guy at the at the record who was putting his record back on. I'm like, what, the, what are you doing? This is my house, my music, right? Well, it was Viva Trilingua. <laughs> Shows you what a fool I was. Well, Let it bleed, still pretty good. And it was also, a, it was a test pressing, and when they would give me the test pressing, they said, go play it on different kind of record players to hear <laughs> Here, if you like the bass in it, or if you like the way it sounds, like like today, you can cut a song in a studio and you can walk out, put it in your car, and basically hear it, because they can make a CD and you'd hear it right away, and that's what it's going to sound like. So there's just ways. How does it sound? Is it going to sound to people with their own record players? I didn't have one. I didn't live anywhere. <laughs> I kind of crashed on people's floors, and I didn't. So that was the record player. I put it on. So you had not seen him play before. You did not know him. I mean, had any inkling who Jerry Jeff Walker was, or? Mm, I don't think so. <laughs> so, Jerry, now from your perspective, I mean, so you. I you're, you're told to get your record player, your records off there. What's your? It wasn't your... even so legal because I hadn't made it yet. <laughs> so it might have been the first one, like the Jerry Jeff oh, one, yeah. you know, had L.A. Freeway and that sort of stuff, because that was still a beginning. I was not known yet in Austin. I mean, I had a record deal when I got here, but I didn't know where I was going to do the record. And the record company sort of said, "We trust him and his." Uh, if he finds a place he wants to make it in, we think he'll make a good record. I didn't know where it was. Was it California? Was it? I had to find some group of musicians, and I knew about kind of Austin, but I had to find out if I could put them all together. How do you get it? You know. So anyway, that's sort of what was going on here. And you know, the first uh, uh, song I ever heard of Jerry Jeffs on the radio was. Um which I thought was just this unbelievable love song. And you know, you listen to the radio and you're doing other things, you don't really hear everything, but it was that old beat up guitar. And then, you know, when I heard it again, it was just like, oh my God, it's a love song to a guitar. <laughs> but it was still a love song. So, I mean, so were there sparks between y'all instantly or did it? Did oh yeah, but not the good ones. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to shoo him away from my, leave my shit alone. 
Plus, I had to admit that I needed some, someone, which I kind of didn't want. I didn't want the complications of it, but I did need help. <laughs> so that, I mean, I actually, I mean, I actually, I actually wrote that down. I mean, you were the thoughts of settling down, maybe at least floating in your head. Yeah, I, I bought a house already, and I was. I wanted to go actually to the hill country because I enjoyed Honda so much. But Honda said, you don't want to own one of those big old stone farmhouses where people have lived upstairs in 20 years and probably the plumbing's bad, electricity's bad, and, and you're way out here. So as close as I could get was Oak Hill. <laughs> where I could go out to the hill country and still make it to the airport to go to a gig. And so it's kind of where I was landing. But the point about it is in Austin, around 70, 71, bars still closed at midnight. So everybody would kind of about 11.30 go, whose house are we going to? <laughs> oh, somebody said, Jim's going to have, come over there. Susan's house was ninth and something. We were probably 15th and something. So not far away. Let's go there. So you'd wind up two, three different places. But Drake's, we had that for a while. as a trek out to Westlake. So, so Viva Trilingua, it, just for some reference point, that's August of 1973. It's the 45th anniversary of that album coming up pretty quick. And uh, Bojangles this year is the 50-year anniversary of that song. But, you know, Jerry Jeff, even before Viva Trilingua, you know, which was the, you know, it seemed like it put all the elements together. I mean, you were, you know, from the, the friends that, I mean, you had a, a bit of a reputation already. The, the wild aspect is starting to come out. I'm going to ask Susan, did you, once you had uh, a friendship relationship with Jerry, I mean, were there some trepidation? I mean, did you, what did you think of this uh, guy with the, with the reputation or, 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 or set us straight? I was young. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're not as near, you don't know what you got, what's going to happen. Well, besides which, I was, with, you know, like I said, I mean, I was running around with these wild, crazy friggin' writers, you know, Larry O'King and Bud Shrake and that group. I mean, they weren't exactly lightweights. And politicians. You know, when it came to partying or drinking. And you were with politicians, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, those people, too. Yeah. <laughs> when I met her, she was working at the Capitol, and I said, you got to get away from those sleazy bastards and come hang out with some <laughs> Some some decent musicians. <laughs> we, we had we That's had probably an, still true. We had an event over here April fourteenth. It was called Literature That Rocks, and one of the guests was Joe Ely, and uh, he was sharing some fun Jerry Jeff stories, including one uh, on that plane on your private jet. You know, that if you all can see, that's uh, Jerry Jeff. I guess doing his best. To, Maybe Richard Nixon impression right there, and Susan life is just a bowl of cherries. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, and and there's a new book by Eddie Wilson, you know, about the Armadillo World Headquarters. Has some stories again, going to that wilder uh, reputation. Some of those antics, some of it sometimes sound can be almost a little John Belushi esque. I mean, what's sort of going on? I mean, seriously, I mean, not everyone grew up in the wild and woolly early 70s. What's kind of going on? This is before Saturday Night Live. It's before a lot of things. I mean, well, what? you, you kind of have to think about it. We were breaking the mold of country music, which were all the bands wore suits and the lead singers doing one thing. We wanted to be more like regular guys. But you're also competing against rock and roll, where I think Ozzy Osbourne was biting off a chicken's head and shit. And, <laughs> Well, we've got to get some attention somehow. <laughs> so, so you're kind of, the boundaries are all shifting and shaking, and some of it is theatrics, and some of it is, is spontaneous, uh, you know, doing it. And so we kind of came from the spontaneous place of, if we have fun and we have fun with what we're doing, we think it's contagious. Can it sometimes get out of control? Because, I mean, there is a great... Yeah, Jerry well, Jeff mythology. Almost. We're not controlling it. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the part of it that's kind of, you got to live it. Yeah. I mean, but it makes it exciting. There is a, a basic amount you will have to do, eight, ten or things. 
things you got to do, but the rest of it, like I could turn to Bob in, in the middle of a set and say, hey, what do you want to play? He said, three coins in the fountain. <laughs> I said, really? Okay, let's try it. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Right. Sometimes we're saying, Louie, Louie, let's try anything. But that was called, uh, that was fun, but we still had a part of the set we had to do. Now, Susan, let me ask you, one of the things in putting, you know, again, we could only put that Viva Jerry Jeff exhibit together through their generous donation of the materials, which is, it's an incredible archive and the work that the archivists did organizing that. But, you know, it, it's, there's a lot of material there. And, you know, we're kind of joking around, but, you know, Jerry Jeff's reputation and his image is bigger than life. But as I was putting it together, you find this is a very complex individual. I mean, can you talk a little bit about that? I, th I think, I mean, uh, any great misconception about Jerry Jeff no. Walker? No. Are they all true? <laughs> Next question. <laughs> <laughs> What's something that they may not know, though? What's something that, that's a complete opposite well, of... Well, part of the thing, too, is you're looking at a career. <laughs> yeah, from, from Susan, I want to hear from Susan. No, I, I'll let you answer it. I was just going to say that at different parts of my life, I was at different ages. Right. Same way that was a young person's song she's singing. Then there's, there's some point where maybe I was experimenting, goofing around. Then all of a sudden, maybe wife and babies come along and it changes your perspective. So it may change what you're doing a little bit. That's where you got the problem of your own reputation preceding you. And, and you go on stage. I remember one thing the Paramount going out and wanting to play something for my father who passed away. His favorite song was My Old Man. And I start right in the middle of the do in the concert. And the guy way up in the back of the row hollers, hey, he'd been someplace having drinks, pissing in the wind. <laughs> and I got up and just said, fuck it. And I walked off. And so it took a while for Susan to calm me back down and get me to go back out on stage. And uh, it, it just, sometimes you, I was in a place that this guy wasn't, I kind of, it kind of wounded me. Right, but I think, and I'm gonna, again, put this back to Susan, because I guess the point I'm trying to make though, again, based on the materials, going through those materials, I mean, this is, you may not like the word, a sensitive young man. I think you're, to be a songwriter, even at this age, you have to be in tune and have a sensitivity for the world you're observing or writing about. And I guess that's what I wanted to ask you, that maybe, you know, people know Jerry Jeff as the, the you know, the country rocker or the, the cosmic cowboy, but maybe can you give us just a little insight into maybe the, uh, the other side that, of maybe how a... Um, well, I mean, he, 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 you hear it in his songs. I mean, you know, he, he lays it all out there. That's his, I don't think you, I know anything you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, is it like a, it, when you're on stage, is it like a light switch, turn it on and performer mode and then off, yeah, off stage sorta, a little different? Sort of, you don't get, you don't want to get too excited. Someone will see you in the afternoon and say, excited about tonight? I go, not yet. I will be as I turn to approach the stage and start in. That's what you mean as far as that goes. But for me, it's all the songs coming along with me that I'm going to experience tonight. It's like a little journey through time that can get a little, you know, cosmic to you after a while. But, I mean, if, if I'm singing them and taking myself back to those places and everything, that kind of... Uh, it's good and it's also uh, tiring. Well, you know, one of the one of the things that sometimes uh, we take for granted is that maybe music is made really easily, or it sounds so natural that it that it's just automatic. But I mean, you'd had a record deal, you know, you'd been making records before Viva Terlingua. You had to have some, I guess, intuition or or feel that you had to sort of change the process. Of, of how you were going to make the record. And I think you're, in, in, you know, both of them together, but are innovators in that way because, for example, uh, bands like Kiss, even, Cheap Trick and Peter Frampton 
couldn't get a hit until they made a live record. You know, now Viva Tolingo is not completely live, but you realized you were missing something from your studio recordings, right, at that point? Or you wanted, tell us what you were going for, I guess. Well, the studio has a way of, first of all, it's the only place you ever play a song four or five times right in a row. You don't do it. If you sit around and play, you play one, then you play another, play another. But a studio will make you sit there and do it and do it and do it, and then you finally just lose your sort of surprise of it uh, in the song. You've got to have this, you're exploring it as you're doing it, feel, I think, to, to be present in the song. Um, I forgot where we were coming from. Uh, Oh, why we went live. Well, the, the thing is to get away from the consciousness. A light goes on, says that they're recording now. Uh, that changes your kind of mood. Uh, when you play in front of people, you kind of forget that. So I thought, well, if we could play as a band in front of people, first of all, we're going to go from one song to another, to another, to another, and not do them three times in a row. And the band's going to relax because they're playing four people and not a machine because you lose the consciousness of the machinery. What was great about Lukenbach was we recorded in the dance hall with the recording part of it being in a mobile truck. It was kind of obscured. So we really didn't see that part. We're just playing. We're just having fun. And that's what we wanted to capture on the record was fun, spontaneous music, and a little picture of what it's like to be in a dance hall in Texas on a Saturday night, say, I mean, and it worked all Yeah, over. the approach worked 100%. And how much of it do you, uh, I want to hear from both of you, but is it just perfect timing? I mean, you know, again, to put a little perspective on it, you know, the country is in the middle of the Watergate hearings. You know, it's a lot of bad news. You know, Nixon is going to resign with in less than a year. I mean, you know, the album is such a fun, good time. You know, it seems like it's a... You know, it seems like that's, boy, that's what Texas is, a, is about. I mean, the timing couldn't have been better for you, could it have been? Well, I, you, know, I, you don't have control over all that, but that's, that was the, the timing of it was to find the mobile truck. There weren't many of those. That lucked out. I said, would you like to go to Texas? And I saw him recording something in New York. And I banged on the truck and went in and said, hey, would you like to go to Texas and make a record? They said, give us a map. We'll be there. And that was a truck put together, really. It was called Dale Ashby and Father, but Pop Ashby had been one of the top engineering studio guys in New York, but he was always in a dark studio working. And he thought, if I could put together this truck, we could take it someplace and I could be outside <laughs> and doing it. And that was, was their goal, was to try to go places where they could set up and play and, and record. And, and I said, well, let's go do the looking back. So then I went right, they were on 48th Street. So I went over to my office at 55th Street in New York and walked in and said, I found where I want to make the record. We're going to make it to looking back. And here's the name of the guy that's going to come and record it. See you later. And I went home. <laughs> I went home and was playing, working on songs. And they called me and said, the truck is already in looking back. <laughs> And they're parked under the trees having a great time. <laughs> and at that point, I said, I got to get this, I got to get together and get this thing to happen. Oh, I won't worry about it because we always have a good time in looking back. Something will make it happen. And we went. Amazing. Now, I got to ask, you know, I, I repeat, you know, Susan is Jerry Jeff's business manager sounding board so i could ask susan from the business side of things if if jerry jeff had that idea today i mean what would you tell him i would tell him go do a live album if the president will uh, oh leave <laughs> yes. no yes I ask. no but how, how do these ideas get hatched you know like a jerry jeff project or an album i mean how what's the creative process you know what that's the whole thing that's the, the reason it's worked with us is is it, when it doesn't work it's when we don't stay in our lane <laughs> oh okay so his if, if his i have nothing to do i take no credit for his music oh, wait. no i wanted to make a live album in belize after he got our house down there i had a lot of fun there I thought I could take the whole band down there and record on the beach. It would be fun. 
and you said, no, your next album is going to be all the songs you've written, and then you can go do it. <laughs> and I had to write the album. Ah, oh, well. And it was a good album, actually. Okay, well. Scamp. So I wrote an album called Scamp, got all the songs done, and said, now we're going to Belize. <laughs> okay, I was wrong. <laughs> now, in um, going down memory lane just a little, little bit, because in doing research for the interview, uh, again, it's fun to be a Jerry Jeff Walker and Susan Walker geek, you know, and then they had the good fortune of having a really cool People magazine article <laughs> about you in 1987. Now, again, it kind of built on this bigger than life, you know what I mean, uh, image, almost like uh, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton uh, portrayal. No, you know, a little, a little, a little fiery, a little. I mean, you know, yeah, how are you? just based on the on the quotes, how, and playful. How are you can get along and duking then, it out and stuff and stuff. Well, do you remember? I mean, that is, you know, I mean, People magazines still moves, uh, you know, issues today. I mean, what was the reaction to that piece? It was a flattering piece, but it was, you know, it kind of played to my maybe, cussing. Yes, for one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, usually so is look, that all? the people that are established in the record business go, how the hell did you ever get in People magazine? Because they're trying to get all their artists in. Well, right. I was going to ask that question. How, how did, how did y'all manage to happen? How did that happen? We knew the guy who owned Time, Inc. <laughs> <laughs> of course we did. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Pop. <laughs> Big Pop from... Uh, yeah. Lufkin owned time, 52% of time, and he loved, he loved the song I wrote called Stoney. But, yeah, and let me throw this question to Susan. I just, I just thought of this because you do, you, I mean, you're Jerry Jeff's wife. You are his business partner. I mean, I could see where, again, an article like that, that's big media. You know, People Magazine, that's a, that's a huge thing. It's like cover of the Rolling Stone or something like yeah. that. You know, I can see where that works with Jerry Jeff Enterprises, but is it tough when some of those stories are out there? You know, it was a lot of, about the partying. There was sort of, this, like I said, sort of a, it seemed like a hyped up version of uh, your old relationship. Well, we don't read People magazine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we didn't really give a shit. Yeah, that was it, that was it, but what, okay. All right. Well, yeah, they got to have some reason for it to be in there, you know, like they're looking for a lost baby or something, you know. So, so what can it be about? And so okay. I guess the, right. the theme has to be these two people kind of working together and doing it and, and how it uh, floats along, I guess. I mean, you know, we were busy then. You know, we had young kids and right. I don't know. It's cute pictures of the kids, I remember. Well, did it come at a good time? Because it does seem to it does seem to time with when Jerry Jeff was going back to being only a solo singer songwriter, getting when, when getting is straight. 80s, 87, 80s. 87 by 87. 87. Oh, that's down the road a bit. Susan took over in 84. 85. 85. Somewhere along in there, I was kind of floating around between that 70s band thing was ending. I had some IRS situations and some. <laughs> I had a, a $90,000 American Express bill. And the guy said, how did you ever get $90,000 on the card? Because usually they have a limit of about 50. And I said, I don't know. Just, they just kept letting it run, I guess. I tried to convince them I could do a commercial for them. To pay him back. <laughs> and my commercial would be, where else can a guy like me get $90,000? <laughs> they didn't go for it. <laughs> but it, Running a band and, and hotel rooms and plane tickets and all the meals and everything else all piling on your card. Uh, you know, it's, it's easy. Those are not my planes. Those are chartered planes. They went on the American Express, too. 
So that's the problem. You think you're doing one thing well, but while something that's happening, something else is piling over here. And the management and the part of people I had didn't stop me. You know, that's what one manager said. My biggest problem with you is I never told you no. And so I just, if I dreamed up schemes and did stuff, occasionally they worked, like we were talking about, something else might not work. And uh, there you go. Fantastic. You know, as, well, as Willie says, you throw enough crap against the wall, some of it sticks. <laughs> you got to kind of keep stirring it up and doing it, part of it. Okay. Now, Jerry Jeff, one of the things, you know, we, uh, when I was putting that exhibit together, I wanted to sort of thread the needle because, you know, you have so many fans that know so much about y'all's music, your life together. But, you know, we're here on a campus where we actually, you know, there are students, some of them born around the time of 9-11, very young people. You know, and I think a lot of your story is that adventurous young man. You know, I've seen young people just looking and sort of looking at those photos of you on the railroad tracks, you know, there on the beach at spring break and, you know, like any young person, they're at the beginning of that of that journey. How did when I let me just add one thing. When I look at those photos, and as I again connecting it to the materials that you both donated, I mean you're as determined in today's vernacular, I guess, as an American Idol kid. You know, you want to make it. I mean, what can you maybe talk a little bit about what it was like? What was in your mind? Did you really think you were going to be a star? Did you just want to see the world? What? I didn't really care about being a star. I just wanted to be able to play the music. I mean, I've heard other artists say that. You just want to be able to play music as long as you want to. Just because you want to doesn't mean you can. Uh, that's the deal. You have to be able to get a break to do it. You have to do it. One of the greatest breaks I had, of course, was Mr. Bojangles. came fairly early, and that's a calling card to kind of keep you playing all the time. And when I came back to Texas, I had, and put the band together, I could get us jobs where local bands might not be able to go to Houston and get a crowd. But if I went there as the guy who wrote Mr. Bojangles and was playing Texas music, they would, uh, we could get more people that way. So that kind of helped a little bit from there. But basically, uh, trying to figure it all out. I mean, I first of all I had to learn to write the songs, then I had to learn how to perform the songs, and then I had to learn how to play with other people for those songs. That became the last challenge. And when I got here, I had worked with studio musicians, but I didn't feel spontaneous about it. And I didn't have the wherewithal to tell them how to play it, just play how you feel the song should be. Now for studio musicians, they go, huh? Because <laughs> they want to be told. You got to play this this way, that's this way. And some of them can play lots of ways, jazzy, bluesy. So I had to kind of figure it all out when I got here. There were enough bands around Austin that knew the music, rock and roll, little country, little folk, all go together. Whatever song I'm playing, play the proper thing that goes with it. If it's a little bird, it's kind of folky and stuff. If it is LA Free, we're, we're going to kick down the doors. We're going to rock. So that's, that was the boundaries. But like, for example, that, you know, when I look at that fo photo with you and the ukulele, I mean, did your parents think you were crazy just hitting the road? I mean, what, what's, oh, going, on? what's yeah. going on at that well, time? Well, yeah. I mean, how do you get out of a small town? I mean, everybody wants to protect you and, and keep you there. And my options were used car salesman or a bartender. I mean, <laughs> the department store is owned by a guy, and he's got a son, and the son's going to own the department store. I don't know. Where, where would I fit in? They were all, all the slots were taken. And so uh, if I was going to be one of those things, I can be those anywhere. So I might as well go see some of the country. And so I was hoping the music would take me, but if not, I would work my way, but yeah, it got to be fun when the music would do it. Susan, let me ask you, I know that you've seen all the photos, I mean, you guys donated them, you know, from the collection. I haven't seen all of them, well, I mean, remember, uh, there was one I'd never seen ever before. But is it, can you tell us a little bit about maybe seeing his, Jerry's story laid out that way and, and sort of that setting, I mean, 
does it put it into some perspective for you? And, and also, when I am curious about this, seriously, when did you learn about his early career as, I mean, pre-Bro Jangles as being sort of this Bob Dylan-styled singer? You know, when, when, you, when, when you put the exhibit up. <laughs> really? Is that, isn't that the correct answer? No, well, it's a good answer, but is, is I mean... Well, she, had the, she had the perfect comment. She said, I was a singer-songwriter, folk singer, right. until I cut Redneck Mother. And then I became a Yahoo bar room band guy. Right. But it was better to have a crowd in that bar paying the bills than to have to be alone playing something sensitive. It was, I was caught. There wasn't enough small places to be able to afford it. I had to get to a bigger place doing the same thing I was doing, but shaking it up a little bit. But I, I, I guess what I'm asking, and, and whether it's whether you learned it from the exhibit or, or as you talking with Jerry, though, I mean, what what does run through your mind that this you know person that you you know met in the '70s though was at least you know Jerry is sometimes dismissive of it, but it was thinking about some of these bigger issues and was caring about the world and humanity and you know the plight of African Americans, hunger. I mean, we found a song recently about that. I mean, to me that. It does go against the image, but it also gives you some insight into sort of the beginning of this person. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean. Well, I guess that, you know, meeting uh, so many of the, of the old folk singers from New York, I guess, that Paul Siebel and, uh, uh, you know, Bromberg and Nick, uh, Nick Holmes and some of these people who yeah. were with him during, uh, David Hamram, they were with him during those days. I wasn't around, I mean, obviously, right. so it was just hearing the stories from there. And it takes me back, because I'm thinking about some of those stories from there, when you ask about things that Jerry Jeff didn't know, I'll eventually a a answer your question, see, is, um, you know, he was always so generous with, and still is, but as far as, I can't tell you how many guitarists this guy gave away when... Yes, when somebody, he was playing it, and they're like, oh, my God, if it was one of that guitar, he just hands it right over to them. But that happened a lot in New York, didn't it, in those early days? Because that's when I heard a lot of those stories. Well, I don't know. Well, Arlo Guthrie, you oh, still yeah. want that guitar back from him. <laughs> Amy Lou. That Steve Goodman got a really good little one. He was having cancer. He was doing those last shows and playing, and he was playing it. He said, boy, that's really good. I love that little guitar. I said, you got it. 